In this video, I'm going to share some tips and tricks for mixing to the new loudness standards, which will include examples and demonstrations, as well as explain what I describe as loudness planning, before ending with some specific tips and tricks for mixing short form content like adverts and promos. With the new loudness workflows, as audio professionals, we're now back in control, and so we can once again be confident that the mix we create will be the same mix heard by the consumer and will not have been messed around with by transmission processing. In the past, I've had to mix programs so they would survive the transmission processing rather than create the mix I wanted. Consequently, the new workflows are liberating. We can now make programs with more dynamic range as we're no longer chasing the loudness wars by having to compress our mixes to increase the perceived loudness whilst keeping them within the peak level delivery specs. Once again, we can trust our ears because when we set our monitoring to the appropriate level and start mixing, the amazing thing is that our mixes just come out right and with a little bit of practice, we'll hit the appropriate target loudness. Because our hearing is very good at perceiving loudness, by setting the monitor levels appropriately, it just works. But hitting the target by ear is much harder if your monitoring isn't calibrated. Recently, I was mixing a program quite early in the morning, and so as not to disturb the family, I had my monitoring lower than normal, and I missed the loudness target. So I had to adjust it in post-production. Another way you can help yourself get in the zone is to pull up some of your older mixes and analyse them with loudness meters to see where they come out on the new loudness standards, and you may well be pleasantly surprised how close they are. People often ask, how will I know how to get the mixes to hit the target? There's an interesting fact that not many people know about, and that is if you set your speech level as before, so it peaks, say, around minus 10 dBFS or PPM6 here in the UK, and then measure that with a BS1770 loudness meter, it will come out at around 0 LU, our target loudness. Now, obviously, compressed speech is perceived louder, so that will read slightly higher but uncompressed speech at normal level will come out at target loudness. In fact, one of the ATSC A85 test files is a sample clip of speech that hits the ATSC target loudness of minus 24 LKFS. As we move from peak metering to loudness metering, people ask about whether to remove the old peak reading meters. Well, for me, it's a matter of personal preference. Although some people are adamant that all peak reading meters should be removed, some folk prefer to retain them as a known reference point. Ultimately, it's up to you. As you build your mixes, make sure that the anchor or foreground sounds, which in most programs is going to be speech, comes in at around your target loudness, whether it's narration in documentaries, dialogue in drama, commentary in sport, or presenters in news programs. When it comes to peak level, consider only going to minus 3 dB true peak, because the lossy codecs used to deliver our content digitally like MP2 and MP4 will distort if the input audio goes much above minus 3 dB true peak. Now, with peak normalization and having a ceiling at around minus 10 dBFS, this wasn't really an issue because we weren't getting close to digital headroom. But now, because we can go up to minus 1 dB true peak with the EBU R128 spec, or minus 2 dB true peak for the ATSC A85 spec, if we don't do something about it, when it gets to the coding stage in the transmission chain, the peak levels will need to be restricted to minus 3 dB true peak to meet the transmission specs to protect the lossy codex. So why not create content that only goes up to minus 3 dB true peak, so the audio doesn't get modified before it goes through the lossy codex? For areas handling live audio, like studio control rooms and transmission areas, the touch monitor loudness meter is getting very popular. You also might like to consider including the TC electronic loudness radar option for your hardware loudness meter.
The radar histogram is very helpful in giving you a sense of where the loudness trends in your mix are going, especially as the nature of the radar display effectively means the histogram folds back on itself. It's also a good idea to use the meter in relative mode so that the target loudness is 0LU. It's easier to aim for, and also if you're high or low, it's a lot clearer because the loudness will be displayed in negative numbers if you're below, and positive numbers if you're above the target loudness. Do experiment with the display preferences, especially the colours for different levels of loudness, to help you get a sense of where the loudness is with just a quick glance at the loudness meter. A number of sound mixers have settled on a colour scheme, just like this one. By using green bands for each of the three loudness meters, it makes it easier to hit the target loudness. This popular configuration is to have different green zones for each of the meters. On the momentary meter, which is averaging the loudness over 400 milliseconds, perhaps have a green zone 3LU above and below your target. With the short-term meter, which averages over the last 3 seconds, perhaps set the green zone to plus and minus 2LU. And for the integrated loudness meter, the average for the whole program, consider setting the green zone to just 1LU above and below your target loudness. Then try using red above your green zones and blue below all of which will make it very easy to see how close you are to the target. Remember that the momentary loudness will vary the most, so significant swings in momentary loudness are absolutely fine. The short term will vary somewhat less than the momentary meter, and the integrated will stabilize very quickly and only move quite slowly. In live situations, you should always have a true peak meter in your studio output. Most digital limiters are in fact sample peak limiters and so will allow inter-sample peaks through unlimited and because true peaks can be anything up to 6 dB higher than sample peaks and now that we're working within 3 dB of digital headroom it is essential that your output limiter is a true peak limiter and not a sample limiter. Now, there aren't that many hardware true peak limiters out there, and if yours doesn't shout it from the rooftops, then it almost certainly won't be a true peak limiter. Until recently, there was just one main contender, and that was the TC Electronic DB6. But more recently, the TC Electronic LM2 has been finding favour as a more cost-effective solution. So that we can be confident that the mix we create is the same mix the consumer enjoys, the true peak limiters should be the only processors in the delivery chain. All other dynamic processors should be taken out, otherwise we'll still end up fighting the transmission processing. And remember to set your true peak limiter to minus 3 dB true peak, so as not to overload the lossy codex. And finally, in live contexts, if you're responsible for multiple feeds like different languages or international feeds, then you may need to consider having more than one loudness meter so that each output has a loudness meter across it to make sure that all your feeds are loudness compliant. Loudness planning should become an integral part of your workflow, just as planning for channel and track counts, desk layouts, etc. are all essential parts of good preparation. So loudness planning should become a critical part of the process, whether you're working in a live or a post-production context. The simplest guidance for loudness planning is to start your program quieter and build it up. The reason for this is that it's much easier to bring the average up later in the program, especially in the louder types of programs, than to start high and then try and bring it down. Also, as you plan your mix, consider the comfort zone. Now, the comfort zone has come out from the listening test that went into the development of the loudness standards. And what they found is that there is a zone within which consumers don't feel the need to reach the remote control to adjust the volume. 
This comfort zone is between plus 3 LU and minus 5 LU around your target loudness, and it's a useful guide to consider for the short-term meter. Because if the program loudness goes outside this comfort zone for a significant period of time, then consumers will tend to reach for the remote control, and that rather defeats the object of this new loudness workflow. Most people, when mixing for post-production, will do their dialogue mix first, working the dialogue to stay fairly close to the target loudness. Then, on subsequent passes, adding and mixing the music and effects, setting them around the foreground sounds as feels appropriate. Because if you have calibrated monitoring, then if an element feels loud, it will be too loud. And if it feels quiet, it will be too quiet. You can trust your ears. Because it's harder to bring the average down, especially on louder shows, consider running the opening credits or any other packages that will be played in throughout a show slightly lower in loudness. Because they're pre-recorded, you can run them through a loudness meter before the show and then you can play them in that little bit quieter. These packages become then your known loudness references and it'll help you keep track of the loudness by having these moments of known loudness. And you'll also find it easier to mix live shows very close to target loudness. And in fact, established mixers can mix live shows to within half an LU using these techniques together with calibrated monitors. And especially on the louder types of shows, like X Factor, it's really hard to bring the average loudness down, especially once you've passed the 10 minute mark. Because we can have a wider dynamic range, and we're no longer constrained to a maximum peak level, we can now configure our compressors with a slower attack, which will allow the transients through, but will manage and control the content if it consistently stays high. So we can still use compressors and limiters to manage the surprises, especially on live or as live shows, but have more transients coming through the mix, which will help to open out our mixes. As I've already mentioned, it's often the case that it's very hard to bring the average down, but it doesn't always have to be the case. An example of the exception that proves the rule is Jeremy Kyle. Now, although there can be a lot of shouting and surprises in these shows, there are also gaps and pauses whilst contributors think about their responses. The programme's style, though, has been for a very loud opening sequence, which in most cases would be very hard to come back from. So I'm going to play you a time-lapse sequence of a complete 10-minute segment from an edition of Jeremy Kyle, exactly as it was mixed on the day. Notice how the opening sequence starts very loud. But as we get into the show, the average starts to drop back. And even though there are several louder moments, they don't have a major impact on the average. So that by the end of the segment, the integrated loudness is within the acceptable tolerance. When it comes to adverts and promos, often called short-form content, all the rules still apply, as well as all the opportunities for increased dynamic range and impact moments. However, because of the intense loudness wars of I want my ad louder than anybody else's, all signs of dynamic range have been squashed out of short-form content. I'm aware that established mixers have even had their mixes rejected that had just 4 dBs of dynamic range as being too much. They were only satisfied when the ad was remixed with no more than 2 dBs of dynamic range.
But the new loudness standards mean that there is no point in having content that is so heavily compressed to make it sound louder. If you do, it will simply be turned down until it meets the target loudness. However, people have started to look for other ways of creating adverts that have impact but meet the spec. One trick was to create an ad where the first 25 seconds or so was very quiet and then they dropped in a really loud payoff line that of course when averaged over the whole ad would hit the target loudness. Consequently, in a number of territories, they've added a requirement for a maximum short-term or momentary loudness for any short-form content. For example, the PLoud group, responsible for the EBU R128 standard, have recently published a revision to R128 for short-form content, that's anything less than one minute in duration, that specifies that the highest short-term loudness can go is plus 5 LU, or the highest that the momentary loudness can go is plus 8 LU. Remember that normally there are only two pass-fail criteria, the integrated loudness and the maximum true peak. The momentary and short-term measurements are there as a guide to help us mix loudness-compliant content. But now for short-form content, there is a maximum short-term or momentary figure added to the pass-fail criteria. But just as for long-form content we can add more dynamic range, so we can for short-form content. I'm going to play you two mixes of the same spoof ad. One mixed to a maximum peak level of minus 10 dBFS and the other to a target loudness with more dynamic range. Take a listen, but also watch the quasi peak and loudness meters as well. Kill the loudness wars now. Whether it's adverts, announcers, or mumbling actors that get people complaining. Buy yourself a loudness meter and stop the complaints dead. Kill the loudness wars now. Whether it's adverts, announcers, or mumbling actors that get people complaining. Buy yourself a loudness meter and stop the complaints dead. You can see from the histograms that the first version has very little dynamic range and is much louder than the second loudness compliant mix that also has more dynamic range. In the loudness compliant mix, the second half is much quieter and more restful, which sits better with the story and also the explosions cut through the mix and have much more impact than they do in the first mix because in that one they're simply bashing into the peak limiter. As we get more experience and these concepts start to be introduced into the creative briefs we're starting to see more opportunities for wider dynamics in ads and promos. Take a look at this histogram of two different mixes of a pet rescue ad. The first part of the ad is in a museum, before the music and effects kick in halfway through. However, in the peak normalised mix, the museum sounds are as loud as the music and effects, and lose their impact, whereas in the loudness compliant mix, the museum section is much quieter, just as you would expect, and then when the music and effects kick in, they have much more impact. So to recap, the opportunity to go through the roof, our 10 dBFS ceiling, is really liberating and enables us to have those moments of impact where we can make things louder if we want to, as long as the overall average for the whole program hits our target loudness. We can add dynamics to our mix and get away from the uniformity that we could end up with when mixing and working to a maximum peak level, the sausage mix concept. Working to these new loudness standards is liberating. We can set our monitor level and mix trusting our ears, knowing that it will come out right and we will hit our target loudness.